Good afternoon. I'm Reverend Dr. Gwen Gibord. I am the founding president of the Gibord Center, whose mission is to bring people together to challenge assumptions, unleash the holy, and affirm the faith that transforms the world. I am absolutely thrilled to have Paul Gordon Chandler with us today. Paul Gordon Chandler is an author, he's an interfaith advocate, an art curator, a social entrepreneur, and he's a U.S. Episcopal priest. He, has, he grew up in Senegal, West Africa. He has lived and worked extensively in the Middle East and North Africa in leadership roles within faith-based publishing, ecumenical relief, and development agencies and the Episcopal Church. From 2003 until 2013, he was the rector of the International Episcopal Church in Cairo, Egypt. He's now based right outside of the Chicago area. He is the founder and president of an organization called Caravan, which is an international peace building nonprofit NGO that uses the arts to build bridges between the creeds and cultures of the Middle East and West. He is also a canon at All Saints Cathedral uh, in Cairo, Egypt, and has authored four nonfiction books in the fields of Christian Muslim relations, global Christianity, and the Middle East. I'd like to list the four books. The first is Pilgrims of Christ on the Muslim Road, Exploring a New Path Between Two Faiths. The second is Songs in Waiting, Spiritual Reflections on Christian Birth, a celebration of Middle Eastern canticles. The third is God's Global Mosaic, what we can learn from Christians around the world. And his most recent book is In Search of a Prophet, A Spiritual Journey of Kiel Gibran. That book is going to be sold today for $20. And uh, Paul Gordon has agreed to sign the book. At the back, we also have copies of uh, The Prophet. Uh, many of us grew up with the prophet and um, phrases of it have been said at more weddings probably uh, than anything else. I want to speak for a moment to uh, this book In Search of a Prophet and then our friend will, will come out. I shared with uh, Paul Gordon, he was very gracious in sending me a, a signed copy of his book long before uh, today and we were in the middle of uh, the holidays and I just didn't have time to take a look at the, at the book. And so fast forward to January the 5th, I had trouble sleeping. And so I picked up the book and I read on into the wee hours of January the 6th, which in the Episcopal tradition is the Feast of the Epiphany when the Magi find Jesus in Bethlehem and honor him. And as I read the book, I discovered on January the 6th, it's also the birth date of Gibran, and I thought, this is very fortuitous. Uh, this is really, I, I want you to buy the book. Now, folks, remember, Valentine's Day is coming up. <laughs> and you're going to want to get the book for your spouse, your honey, your beloved, your 17-year-old daughter, uh, your 18-year-old son. This is a, a gift. It's a journey within a journey of uh, Paul Gordon following the uh, trails of Cahill Gibran and of Gibran himself, who was a truly, truly gifted and amazing man. So he was a Renaissance man. And I want you to meet the other Renaissance man. Please welcome warmly Paul Gordon Chandler. It's a real honor to be here uh, this afternoon, and I want to thank the Gibord Center for this opportunity. I want to thank all of you for coming out on a Saturday afternoon from 1 to 3, no less, to hear about someone who I think is not only one of the most profound figures to have lived in the last century, but who I also think is exceedingly, increasingly relevant for our times. Someone who is a prophetic voice during his own lifetime and whose words I think are even more timely today. 
Khalil Gibran, the early 20th century, Lebanese-born, Arab-American, poet-artist, and mystic, most known, of course, in the West as the author of the best-selling book, The Prophet. I'm just curious, in an audience like this, how many of you, at one time in your life or another, came in contact with The Prophet or Gibran in some of his other writings? Just raise your hand. It's very interesting. You know, when I go around and speak, sometimes you have quite large audiences, and as 95% of those there have been influenced by, especially the prophet. But so few know much about him. I grew up in Senegal, West Africa, as was mentioned a minute ago, a Muslim-majority context. I spent the first 18 years of my life there. And when you need wisdom or counsel in a context like that, you go to an elder, someone with life experience, someone who has gray hair, some of you qualify in here in that category, and they always respond with proverbs or parables, usually in the local language, which is wolf. And when I think about this long journey that I've been on of looking deeply into the life and the spirituality of Khalil Gibran, which actually resulted in writing this book, there's a wolf proverb that comes to mind. And it goes like this, first in the language of wolf. And it means this. If you have a monkey for your friend, you'll never get your loincloth stuck in a tree. <laughs> Meaning, it's who you know at challenging moments in time that makes all the difference. And there's no question that that was very much what was behind me going on this profound exploration, if you will, into the life of Halil Shabran. Sometimes something written long ago becomes seemingly even more relevant than during its own day, as happened here about a year ago with George Orwell's 1984, which shot to the best-selling list, of course. And more than ever, I think there's a need to hear voices that call us to unity and to respect. That's what the, the, uh, the march is all about out there. To be inspired to live deeply and generously in our thinking and our actions toward the other, whomever the other is. And I believe Khalil Gibran is just that voice and he offers us profound insights for our day, much needed wisdom and guidance. It all started for me when I was living in the Middle East. I'm 53 years of age and I spent most of my life in North Africa or the Middle East. And I was struck by how enthusiastically Khalil Gibran is loved, both throughout the Middle East and certainly in much of the West. The East was proud of him and the West admired him. He was very much this uniting figure. And it intrigued me to look more deeply, not just into his life and his work, but into his inner journey of spiritual development, his kind of spiritual formation, if you will. And in so doing, I came to discover that Khalil Gibran is really the supreme East-West figure. And as a result, can be very much for us what I would consider an unparalleled spiritual guide for our times related to peace, related to harmony, certainly related to the building of bridges between the creeds and cultures of the Middle East and West. And his life and approach and work, they touch on so many of the critical issues of today. A bridge, yes, for us between creeds and cultures. Care for the environment. Equality for women. Interest in spirituality as opposed to institutional religion. Immigration. The status of refugees. Syria and the conflict in the Middle East. The inclusive embrace of those of different faiths and looking for the best in each tradition. And the list goes on and on. And of course, he also touches on that spiritual depth that so many people crave. On the crisis in Syria, during his time, he wrote, My heart burns for Syria. Fate has been most cruel to her. Her gods are dead. Her children left her to seek bread in faraway lands. And yet she's still alive. And that's the most painful thing. It could have been written yesterday. 
As it was said about Ibn Arabi, the 13th century Arab Sufi mystic, poet, and scholar, he is a man for this time because he has his foot in every camp. And I wanted to delve more deeply into his inner spiritual journey and immerse myself in his writings and the environments that shaped him. And more specifically, I sought to understand what led him from being someone that was born into, at that time, a exclusive, historic, an intolerant, sectarian Christian community to becoming someone who actually ended up embracing all in our world and as a result, very often, is embraced by all. And it took me all over the world, to museums, to art galleries, to churches, to mosques, through revolutions, through counter-revolutions. It first involved over the course of several years visiting all the places that he lived and taking Khalil with me, so to speak, in other words, taking his writings and reading, reading everything he wrote in the order that he wrote them, in the places that he wrote them, during each respective phase of his life. It also led me to the far plate reaching places of influence that his writings and his art have traveled. I began in his birthplace village of Bishari, where I actually was about 12 days ago, high up in the snowy mountains of Lebanon. And then on to Boston, where he and his family emigrated, to Paris, where he did his art training, to New York, where he spent most of his career, ending up in Mexico City, of all places, at the spectacular Museo Sumaya, where the largest collection of Khalil's art and writings is held in the Western Hemisphere. And so many places in between, such as Cairo, Egypt, where almost all of his, his works written in Arabic were first published, to Savannah, Georgia, and the Telfair Museums, which have the largest collection of his art here in the United States, to the Detroit area and the Arab American National Museum that are focused very much on preserving his legacy, and so many places in between where monuments and streets and schools and parks are named after him. And it didn't take me long to realize that I knew a lot less about Khalil than I had imagined. I knew he was Lebanese, I knew he was of Christian background, though I admit as a young man, I actually assumed he was Muslim, as a lot of people do because of the title of The Prophet, his best-selling book. I knew that he lived in the early 1990s, and I knew that he had written a spiritual best-selling book of poetry titled The Prophet. However, what I didn't know was far greater. I didn't know that Khalil is one of the most widely read poets in history behind only Shakespeare and Lao Tzu. I didn't know that Elvis Presley was one of his greatest fans who gave away thousands of copies of The Prophet, had completely memorized it, was able to open it up and you could just choose, pinpoint an area and he could finish the entire book by heart. One of his last great projects was working on a feature film of The Prophet. I didn't know that the singer Johnny Cash was equally captivated by Khalil's writings and message. I didn't know that he was a friend of the Teddy Roosevelt family. I didn't know that he was sought out after by the Irish poet William Butler Yeats to have his portrait drawn by him and that Yeats' wife loved it so much that she begged Khalil to do one of her as well. I didn't know that he knew and drew the Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung and the Indian Nobel Prize laureate Rabindranath Tagore. I didn't know that he met Auguste Rodin, the great French sculptor, when he was studying art in Paris, and that while he was in Paris, some of the great Impressionist artists were still around, Monet, Renoir, Degas, Marie Cassatt, even Picasso, in his early days, was around at that time, and while Gibran was in Paris, Marc Chagall moved to Paris. I didn't know that the morning after the Titanic sank, when he was obviously very troubled and had been unable to sleep, he struggled to know if he should actually cancel his appointment to draw the portrait of the leader of the Baha'i faith, Abdul Baha. He decided to go ahead with the, the sitting and he was profoundly moved by Abdul Baha's calming presence. I didn't know, more humorously, that during the height of the American prohibition on alcohol, Khalil, with his proclivity toward a rock, that strong Levantine anise-flavored alcoholic drink, was able to secure, almost miraculously, this continuing flowing stash of the contraband. <laughs> I didn't know that Queen Noor 
was influenced by Halil's work at a young age and is an avid promoter of his writings, as are the actors Selma Hayek and Liam Neeson. I didn't know that Halil was almost excommunicated by his own Maronite Catholic Church as a heretic for its early attacks on the religious hypocrisy that he saw in it, and yet paradoxically at the very end at his funeral in, at the cathedral in Beirut, he was honored by the Maronite Patriarch and all other church authorities in Lebanon, as well as from leaders of other faiths from all around the world. I didn't know that Halil's writings were instrumental, actually, in sparking a reformation, even a renaissance in Arabic literature, as he broke with the rigid Arabic literary canons of his day, and very much through his prose poetry, developed a new genre of Arabic literature. I didn't realize that he was seen as a political revolutionary early on in his career, speaking out through his writings against the injustices of the Ottoman occupation in Lebanon, which was called Syria then, Greater Syria, and calling on his fellow countrymen to rise up to free themselves from that oppressive yoke. I didn't know that one of the wealthiest men in the world, Carlos Slim, a Mexican of Lebanese heritage, has one of the largest collections of Khalil's art and writings down in Mexico City. I didn't know that one of President John F. Kennedy's most famous quotes was taken from an article that Khalil wrote in Arabic to his countrymen, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. I had no idea of the scope of his influence worldwide, both of in terms of his reach geographically and as to the diversity and the breadth of the groups that identify with him. I remember being in Timbuktu, Mali in the Sahara Desert and in this little mud brick home of a Tuareg friend, the, 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 the men in blue is what they're called there in the desert. And there, there's hardly any furniture in this uh, home, and there's a little rickety bookshelf there, and on it is a French copy of the prophet. And he seems to be claimed by every group and circle imaginable. Khalil the poet, Khalil the novelist, Khalil the essayist, Khalil the activist, the revolutionary, the counterculturalist. Khalil the philosopher, Khalil the artist, Khalil the painter, Khalil the modernizer of Arab literature, Khalil the prophet, Khalil the new age guru, Khalil the visionary, Khalil the humanitarian, Khalil the Sufi, Khalil the Christian, Khalil the universalist, Khalil the interfaith mentor. He's an enigma, begging the question, will the real Khalil Gibran please stand up? The renowned contemporary Syrian poet Adonis summed it up perfectly when speaking of Khalil. He's a star spinning outside the orbit of that other sun in his universal acceptance. Khalil's older friend and fellow writer Amin Rahani, whose portrait incidentally is on the cover of my book, this is not Gibran, this is actually a portrait of his best friend, said of him, through Arabic he conquered our minds and through English he conquered our hearts. Gibran, Khalil Gibran, was born in 1883 into a Maronite Christian family high up in the mountains in Lebanon, a region known as the Kadisha Valley, which means the Sacred Valley. It was a place that had sheltered its people over the centuries through many invasions, and it resounds with majestic natural beauty, which had an important and a lasting influence on him. In contrast, though, to those gorgeous, peaceful surroundings, uh, he was born into a period of political and interreligious strife, as, one as, as well as one full of religious corruption by the authorities, the religious authorities, during that latter part of a 400-year-long Ottoman occupation. All circumstances that would influence his life and work for years to come. Khalil was a quiet, creative child, and his mother stood out as a caring and empowering presence in his life, and sensing his unique creative talents and what you might even say his spiritual sensitivity very early on as a child. She sought to encourage him, and at one point she secured a copy of Leonardo da Vinci's artwork to give him as a gift, which Khalil remembered as a pivotal moment in his early life. He was only six years old, and he wrote of the experience. I'll never forget that moment as long as I live. It was as if a ship lost in the fog had suddenly found a, comp a compass. 
His grandfather had been a Maronite priest, and thanks to his mother, he was taught the great biblical epic stories which captured his imagination at a young age, which are often known by Christian Muslims and Jews. And of course, it showed up again, if you know his writing, his imagery, uh, as he continued on his career. Khalil's family was not very reliable, prone to drink, with gambling debts, and he was accused of, his father was accused of embezzlement while working for the local Ottoman administrator, and he was sent to prison, and all the family's property was lost. And his mother eventually decided to follow her relatives to America here and emigrated with Khalil's half-brother and his two young sisters just before he entered his teenage years. And although Khalil spent only 12 short years in that magical mountainous setting, it was to serve as the foundation for his spirituality for the rest of his life. Once in America, they settled into Boston's South End, and Khalil began to learn English, and a whole new world of artistic influences began to open up to him. As a young teenager, he met the avant-garde Bostonian photographer and publisher, Fred Holland Day, who was equally intrigued with this young Khalil from the Middle East, and Day introduced him to the whole new world, of a vast world of literature and of art, and very much encouraged his artistic ability. Concerned, though, that Khalil, as often happens, by the way, with Middle Easterners when they move to the West, concerned that he was losing his Arabic culture and his values, his mother decides to send him back to Lebanon to complete his high school education under the watchful care of the Maronite Catholic Church in East Beirut. And his story unfolds from there. Upon his return to Boston after lycée, after high school, and within, 18 -month within an 18-month period, he lost one of his sisters and his half-brother to tuberculosis, and then his mother quickly to cancer. After a devastating fire that pretty much destroyed everything that he had painted to date, he begins to write, and he writes more intensely, and he becomes involved with the world of Arab immigrant writers in Boston. And he began to express his feelings through outspoken, some might even say scorching, articles in Arabic newspapers here in the U.S. and books and magazines. And as an immigrant, he discovered he actually had the liberty to write in a way that he never would have been able to write had he lived in the Arab world at that time. And with boldness and without repercussions, he crafts stories and articles addressing highly sensitive issues. He began to call on his Lebanese people to question ideologies, and as he himself began to grapple with religion and spirituality. He spoke out, as an, out in his articles against the oppression by the Ottomans, and he was concerned by sectarian strife that was more often than not then fueled by the religious authorities. And of course, he was very, very disgusted with their hypocrisy. And during this time, he also became very passionate about women's rights. And for the next 10 years, 1903 to 1913, from the age of 20 to 30, Khalil would seek to balance the push and pull of these two linguistic and artistic worlds as he found himself poised at a confluence of cross currents between the East and West. And determined to tear down walls of injustice, he eventually found himself threatened with excommunication from authorities in the Maronite Catholic Church of his upbringing. He had just completed a brilliant work titled Spirits Rebellious, in which, interestingly, one of the stories he titled Khalil the Heretic. And he blasts in the story, he blasts the hypocrisy of religious corruption, oppression of the weak and the vulnerable. And not surprisingly, not too long after this, while he's in Paris, representatives of the patriarch in Lebanon who were visiting France asked to see him in order to put him in line. And he related the encounter quite lightheartedly to a friend who recorded it in her journal. She wrote of the experience. One bishop had a sense of humor, the other none. Not much has changed, by the way, in that regard. <laughs> Non-humorous took him aside. You've made a grave mistake and are making a grave mistake. Your gifts you are using against your people, against your country, against your church, and the Holy Patriarch realizes this. And now seek out every copy of the book, destroy them all, and take, let me take word from you back to Syria and the church and the Holy Patriarch. 
Well, as you can imagine, that exchange only spurred Khalil on, uh, Khalil on further, and he actually early on saw himself somewhat as a revolutionary and a rebel, writing that life without rebellion is like the seasons without spring. He was an advocate for freedom within and without. He wrote to a cousin around that time who was living in Brazil, the people in Syria are calling me a heretic. And the intelligentsia in Egypt vilifies me, saying he's an enemy of just laws, of family ties, and, and of old traditions. Those writers are telling the truth. Because I do not love man-made laws, and I abhor the traditions that our ancestors left us. This hatred is the fruit, though, of my love for the sacred and spiritual kindness, which should be the source of every law upon the earth. For kindness is the shadow of God in man. Through his Arabic novella titled Broken Wings, he became an advocate for women well ahead of his time. Very apropos to think about today because of this march. He had an incredibly high view of women, whether friend or stranger or lover or sister or mother. And he consistently fused his admiration for them into the essence of his painting and his writing. It's especially noteworthy considering the patriarchal society that, of his childhood and also the time period here in America in which he was immersed as women were in the thick of the fight for the right to vote. Even his view of God echoed these convention, convictions of gender equality and pushed the boundaries very much at that time of the accepted norm. He wrote, most religions speak of God and the masculine gender. God is to me as much a mother as God is a father. God is both father and mother in one. However, albeit an activist early on in his life, as he often wrote of growing into our greater selves, you see him mature into this individual with a graciousness towards all and an all-embracing spirituality that reaches across the divides of humanity building bridges of peace. And he moves from being an activist to very much more so an artistic contemplative, using his many creative gifts to communicate his insights. And regarding his art and writing, one supported the other. When asked which he preferred, he refused to separate them, separate them responding with the impossibility of choosing a favorite child. At a very crucial time in his life, he was introduced to what became his lifelong friend and patron, Mary Haskell, who appeared in a very supportive role to him, setting up on him on a course that would allow him to pursue and cultivate his many gifts. She eventually funded two years of art education in Paris for, so he could master the fundamentals, and from that experience he was allowed to discover and cultivate his own unique style that the world now knows him for. After his time in Paris, he moved to New York City, and he continued to publish works in Arabic and exhibited his artwork at a few very significant galleries. And then in 1918, his first book in English was published, titled The Madman. And it was quickly followed by a second book. These are written in English, not translated. A second book titled The Forerunner. And by 1923, his third book in English, the prophet quickly gained worldwide acclaim as his message of universality and respect was reaching far wider audiences. He also worked on his longest English book, Jesus the Son of Man, for much of his adult life, seeking to return the Jesus that he very much felt had been disfigured here in the West back to his Middle Eastern origins, publishing this creative masterwork just three years before he died at the age of 48. The more I studied of Khalil's fascinating life, the more intrigued I became with his inward journey. More than anything else, it was evident that his life was lived toward what you might say a deeper dimension. And he wove this passionate intent into the core of his writings in art. He was a natural mystic who quite simply sought to build bridges and tear down walls. And his voice is timeless, appealing to heart and mind, faith and reason, a guiding spirit very much now at a time when stereotypes and misunderstandings are increasing ever-widening divides. 
As he so powerfully wrote, I believe in the book, capital B, that makes us all brothers and sisters equal before the Son. I believe in the teachings that set you and me free from any kind of bondage and place us unfettered here upon the earth, the stepping place of the feet of God. Certainly, heeding his wisdom would go a long way to healing our world. And in this regard, I think it seems to me that there are two overarching themes to Halil's life and work. And the best analogy I can think of is one that he used a lot, that of a river. But as I think of his life, I think of it as a river flowing deep and wide. As he plumbed the depths of his inner life, he went to the core of human existence. He was forever exploring the deepest of life's questions on the purpose of being, he writes. Spiritual awakening is the most essential thing in life, and it's the sole purpose of being. He who does not befriend his soul is an enemy of humanity, for life emerges from within. He described himself as literally going into the silence, intentionally so. He wrote, only when you drink from the river of silence shall you indeed sing. He even named his New York studio the Hermitage, and he decorated it sparsely in a manner that created a contemplative atmosphere for him, a simple wooden bed, several crucifixes made of wood and metal, a small brass chalice, an easel, a tapestry, a large tapestry of a Middle Eastern Christ that hung on the wall behind, on, above an altar-like table with two big brass candlesticks. I love Khalil's short story titled The Tempest that's very well known in the Arab world. It's infused with the imagery of a hermitage, a hermitage in his childhood village in Lebanon. It's actually now the place that he's buried. The story tells of a young man who's roaming the cedar forest there in the mountains one autumn afternoon, and he gets caught in a terrible rainstorm. And he seeks cover in an isolated shelter that's actually inhabited by a hermit named Yusuf. And he's heard of Yusuf from the local villagers and had longed to meet him one day to learn his spiritual secrets. And this storm, of course, provides him the perfect excuse. And when the young man is welcomed into Yusuf's shelter, he notices that the old man is tending to a bird with broken wings. So symbolism abounds here. And the old hermit engages in conversation and slowly imparts his wisdom through all this beautiful imagery. And he shares that he left the world to live in the awakeness of life and to think upon the compelling and beautiful mystery of existence. I, he says, I came to this far corner of God's domain, for I hungered to learn the secrets of the universe and approach close to the throne of God. And as the story climaxes, the hermit leaves the young man sheltered there in the hermitage, and he walks out into the storm at the height when it's just at its fiercest. And he says to the young man, I'm now going to walk through the night with the tempest. It's a practice that I enjoy greatly. I hope you will teach yourself to love the tempest. Khalil consistently succeeded at crafting these poetic invitations to journey toward the depths of oneself, exploring that rich reservoir within. In another reflection, he notes, God has placed in each soul an apostle to lead us on an illumined path. And yet many seek life from without, unaware that it is actually within them. When someone asked him once, what's a mystic? Khalil is said to have smiled and replied, nothing very secret nor formidable, just someone who has drawn aside one more veil. He was constantly listening, paying attention to life, ever in search of greater interior depth, the soul is mightier than space, he said, stronger than time, deeper than the sea, and higher than the stars. And he was preoccupied during his entire life with the depths that he knew the spirit of humanity was able to plumb and the heights that he was convinced humanity was destined to scale, always striving toward that deeper dimension. 
He spoke of his painting process in similar terms to his friend and patron, Mary Haskell. When I paint a picture, I try to give the picture a presence. It's the coming together of certain elements in a certain way, as if they made a sort of path along which God can come through to our consciousness. Another time he wrote to her, I have obtained a first-rate telescope, and I spend an hour or two every evening staring into infinity, close to that which is distant and remote, and, and in awe of the greater whole. Khalil saw depth everywhere. The collection of imagery and created synonyms that Khalil used for God are many. The infinite, the almighty, God creator, nature, love, eternal wisdom, unseen, eternal altar, all powerful, supreme infinite, Lord of life and of love and of death, great spirit, great intelligent being, great power, the unknown, the great sea, the great river, the absolute. Of Khalil's belief in God, his contemporary Lebanese biographer, Alexander Najjar, writes, what kind of God did Gibran believe in? His view of God was not mainstream. Gibran's mysticism is a convergence of several different influences. Christianity, Islam, Sufism, Theosophy, and Jungian psychology. It was a message of coexistence. He rejected fanaticism and religious segregation of any kind and called his convictions from a synthesis of different religious messages without their dogmatism. He could not reasonably confine himself to any one of the three great monotheistic religions. And over and over again, Khalil focused in his work on love for the divine or the transcendent rather than religion. During a time of deep despair and discouragement, and by the way, you cannot understand Khalil unless you understand that he suffered. During a time of difficulty, he said, but somehow when I feel like a little helpless fish in a muddy lake, I cannot help but say to myself, the air which is above the water is not muddy. I cannot lose my faith in the God element. And in a time when I think it becomes harder and harder actually to listen to our inner selves, our souls, or however you want to term that, to listen to what we may need spiritually, I think he exemplifies someone who journeyed intentionally inward, creating room for silence, and to listen to the quiet nudgings of his soul, and intent on allowing both the high and low moments of life to weave together into one voice. And it's that voice within a voice that Khalil wanted his readers to hear when reading his writings. As his good friend, the eminent American architect and writer Claude Bragdon said of him, his power came from a great reservoir of spiritual life, else it could not have been so universal or so, po so potent, but the majesty and the beauty of the language with which he clothed it were all his own. I think this depth is what led the actor Salma Hayek to produce a film on Khalil's book, The Prophet. Perhaps some of you have seen it. One of my most enjoyable kind of research trips on working on this book was to go to the premiere of The Prophet at the Toronto International Film Festival. And it's an adapt ad animated adaptation of The Prophet, and it's directed by Roger Ayers, who's most known for The Lion King. And the film, actually, I found, was a visual extravaganza with animated chapters from award-winning animation directors from all over the world and beautiful music featuring world-class musicians, singers, and composers such as Yo-Yo Ma and Gabriel Yared. It was a deeply moving experience for me. In fact, it was the only time, with the exception of the film Gandhi, that I've observed such reverent silence in a cinema when the film ended. No one in this diverse audience from all over the world, and most were young people, moved or said a thing. The after party, I had the opportunity of speaking with Salma about her inspiration in producing the film, and with her contagious exuberance, she shared her own connection to the prophet, which was through her Lebanese grandfather, who she remembers always had kept a copy of the prophet there on his bedside table or stand. 
Later, as a young adult, she read the prophet herself and was profoundly moved. She told us, I found out that there are millions of people around the world who have shared the same kind of connection to this book, in which the words of Khalil have so strongly impacted them positively and spiritually. And when you read this book, something really strange happens inside of you. Your soul recognizes it as truth. She went on to say to me that that's why she made the film. She said, I thought it was crucial that we pay further tribute to this man who was an Arab, who wrote a book of spiritual philosophy that unites all religions and all countries and all creeds for many different generations. And in those comments, I think Salma really captured the essence of Khalil's inner journey, because the deeper he went, the wider actually his embrace became. The depth of Khalil's spiritual journey led to this extraordinary breadth of spirit in which he experienced the oneness of humanity. The reservoirs that he cultivated in the deep actually gave him the capacity to go wide. And arising from his internalized bridging of Eastern and what these different uh, Eastern and Western influences in his life, a faith emerged over time that actually transcended all cultures and all religions. Addressing his fellow Arabs in the Middle East, Khalil wrote, humans are divided into different clans and tribes and belong to countries and towns. But I find myself a stranger to all communities and belong to no settlement. The universe is my country and the human family is my tribe. Thou art my brother and my sister because you are human and we are both children of one Holy Spirit. We are equal and made of the same earth. Khalil went beyond religion to the core of a universal spirituality. And at that time, this is after World War I, when the Middle East was being divided up, of course, by the West somewhat artificially, the West tended to think of it in terms of Muslim civilization and Christian civilization. Khalil only thought of it as one civilization. And his beliefs cut through such divides, reaching across to the other. And as he power, so powerfully said, your neighbor is your other self dwelling behind a wall and understanding all walls fall down. Obviously, he recognized the necessity of boundaries and nations, and yet he very much strove toward a borderless citizenship that transcended geography. I love the way he addressed his collective embrace for humanity with this, the beautiful poetic visual imagery of a cloud. He wrote, should you sit upon a cloud, you would not see the boundary line between one farm and another, or between one country and another. It's a pity you cannot sit upon a cloud. Just before the onset of the First World War, Khalil wrote an essay titled An Open Letter from a Christian Poet to Muslims. And in it, he refers to himself as a Christian who placed Jesus in one half of his heart and Muhammad in the other. Khalil's ever-embracing spirituality continued to mature and was thoughtfully expressed in his collection of aphorisms in English titled Sand and Foam, and in that he wrote, Should you really open your eyes and see, you would behold your image in all images. And should you open your ears and listen, you would hear your own voice in all voices. Obviously words that continue to echo and inspire. In touching on the most sensitive topic of all in the Middle East, religion, he does so by looking to the nature of God. You are my brother and sister and I love you. I love you worshiping in your church, kneeling in your temple, and praying in your mosque. You and I are all children of one religion, and the very paths of religion are but the fingers of the loving hand of the Supreme Being extended to all, offering completeness of spirit to all, and anxious to receive all. 
And finding a way to powerfully communicate a non-sectarian version of spirituality was something that weighed very heavily on Khalil. And consequently, he felt all the events of his life seemed to lead him toward the creation of his most well-known book, The Prophet. Of The Prophet, and this is what it looked like when it first came out, it was called The Little Black Book. Of The Prophet, he wrote, it's the biggest challenge of my life. My entire being is in The Prophet. Everything I've ever done before was only a prelude to this. And he felt almost a sense of sacred responsibility while he was writing it, as if it was to be a holy book. Even the process of writing it was a type of spiritual rebirth for him. And embodying East and West, it speaks to people from all religions, and it prompted his friend and patron and sometimes editor, Mary Haskell, to remark upon first receiving a copy of it when it was released, Oh, Khalil, it's the most loving book ever written. The prophet actually made his literary debut in a public reading in Manhattan's uh, East Village at St. Mark's in the Bowery, an Episcopal church. It's the oldest continuous place of practice, of religious practice in New York. And the then rector at that time was a very progressive person, and he was a close friend of Frank Lloyd Wright. He knew Khalil, and Khalil exhibited some of his art there for a while, and then when the prophet came out, he invited him to have a public reading of the prophet. Khalil didn't do the reading. They invited a well-known actor, Butler Davenport, to do it. And Khalil was there. I gave a talk there not too long ago, and they supposedly they showed me where Khalil was sitting during that first public reading. And there, after the reading, Khalil said, well, he said two things. The first thing he said, I sure wish he hadn't read the whole thing. <laughs> and then the second thing is, I had first wanted it read in a church. Interestingly, as Khalil continued to journey spiritually, he sought to sift through his own religious upbringing, through all the baggage and trappings and tradition that had accumulated around it over the millennia. And just as the Dalai Lama is said to have encouraged the Trappist monk and writer Thomas Merton to not convert to Buddhism, because he was very much taken with Buddhism, but instead to go deeply into his own tradition and find its core essence, Khalil finds himself actually doing the same thing and discovering the figure of Jesus, actually, in a new way. And he came to see the person of Jesus as far beyond Christianity and instead as almost a universal sage for all humanity. In Jesus, he saw this all-embracing figure, and he was enraptured by his character. He said his life, and his life is the symbol of humanity. He shall always be to me the supreme figure of all ages. And one of my little vignette, favorite vignettes of Khalil's is about separating the Jesus of history from the Jesus of a religion, Christianity, that grew up around him. Khalil writes, Once every hundred years, Jesus of Nazareth meets Jesus of the Christian in a garden among the hills of Lebanon. And they talk long. And each time, Jesus of Nazareth goes away saying to Jesus of the Christian, My friend, I fear we shall never, never agree. Observing the corruption and inequalities and even sectarian power plays of the church in Lebanon at that time as a young man, he was obviously naturally drawn to the radical this radical aspect of Jesus' all-embracive, all-inclusive love, and also the strength of his humility. It was the antithesis of everything he saw in institutional Christianity at that time. And he considered Jesus to be the greatest of all artists and poets. He is the master poet who makes poets of us all. He also pictured Jesus as a fellow Middle Easterner, and he felt this deep personal cultural connection to Jesus, and hence the opportunity to write about Jesus' life became this ever-increasing aspiration. Jesus, the Son of Man, was the longest and the last book that Khalil wrote before his death. Some actually see it almost like a fifth gospel, and in it he delivers a mesmerizing picture of the essence of Jesus. Although Khalil often spoke directly of God, his writings and his art were infused with a far greater concern, that of living in harmony with one another and with all creation. 
He wrote, I bid you to speak not so freely of God, yes, who is your all, but rather speak to and understand one another, neighbor unto neighbor. Ideals, of course, so important and so necessary in our contemporary context. Also to Halil, while spirituality served as an attempt to connect with the divine, he realized that it could not be found in creeds or dogma, and that to search for God solely in a mosque or a church or a temple was very much to limit one's search for wholeness. And so his quest became this opportunity to unearth that which was woven into the very fabric of creation, in other words, the environment. And in an age when issues in our environment are at the forefront with deep respect for the earth, Khalil's holistic worldview very much rings forth. And he didn't separate the spiritual dimension of life from the natural world, but he saw them very much in harmony. Just after Easter in 1931, after a battle with ill health, Khalil lay dying. He was taken to St. Vincent's Hospital in New York City, the same hospital that actually received survivors from the Titanic disaster for treatment, and was then again used to treat victims of the September 11th attack. At age 48, with cirrhosis of the liver and tuberculosis in one lung, Khalil slipped from this world into the realm he believed would be an endless dawn forever the first day. And the breadth of diversity and the outpouring of appreciation for his life, I think, says it all, reaching across all religious and cultural divides. In New York City, it was a rabbi who had known Khalil since his early days in the U.S. that undertook the task of arranging the tribute. It was titled A Tribute to the Spirit of Khalil Gibran. And it was a mosaic of diversity with leaders from numerous faith traditions praising his life, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, Baha'i, Theosophist. As requested in his will, Khalil's body then made the pilgrimage back to Lebanon, accompanied by his sister, Mariana. Upon arriving by ship in Beirut, the coffin was opened and he was posthumously awarded the Decoration of Fine Arts Medallion from the Ministry of Education for his life's work. And then led by governmental dignitaries, French military officers, diplomats from all over the world, and leaders from Christian, Muslim, Druze, and Jewish communities, along with crowds of schooled school children. The entourage processed past thousands of admirers who lined the streets until they reached the Maronite Catholic Cathedral, where his body was blessed by the Archbishop. Once thought of as a rebel by the church, in the end, he's welcomed home as a celebrated native son. In the tribute to Khalil that was held the next day in Beirut's Grand Theater, the president of Lebanon, renowned writers and poets, representatives from the Islamic, Christian, and Druze communities, they all reflected on Khalil's spirituality and his universal appeal. There's a Christian speaker there that day who said he was a Sufi sage for all humanity. And then the procession on foot made the 50-mile journey from Beirut all the way up to his home village up in the mountains of Bishari, and all the way without any break lined with townspeople. They stopped 20 times for local ceremonies. Then he was eventually laid to rest as he had requested in the hermitage grotto of his childhood, high up in the mountains of his beloved cedar trees, which is actually now the Gibran Museum. More than ever, Halil's own words rang true. For in one soul are contained the hopes and feelings of all mankind. One of my favorite allegories by Halil is titled, The River. It's frequently read at funerals and memorial services and is reminiscent of Longfellow's Hiawatha. It's set in his beloved Kanisha Valley, the Sacred Valley, and it visually highlights, I think, Halil's life journey, one mixed with both joy and suffering, but which always led to that deeper realm, the river. In the valley where the mighty river flows, two little streams met and spoke to one another. One stream said, how came you, my friend, and how was your path? And the other answered, my path was most encumbered. 
The wheel of the mill was broken, and the master farmer who used to conduct me from my channel to the plants is dead. And I struggled down, oozing with the waste of those who do not but sit and bake their laziness in the sun. But how is your path, my brother? And the other stream answered and said, mine was a different path. I came down the hills among fragrant flowers and shy willows. Men and women drank of me with silvery cups, and little children paddled their rosy feet at my edges. And, and there was laughter all about me, and there were sweet songs. What a pity that your path was not so happy. At that moment, the river spoke with a loud voice and said, Come in, come in. We are going to the sea. Come in, come in. Speak no more. We are going to the sea. Be with me now. Come in, come in, for in me you shall forget your wanderings, sad or joyful. Come in, come in, and you and I will forget all our ways when we reach the heart of our mother, the sea. Khalil's life journey of depth and breadth, I think, can't help but challenge all of us. His words continue to reverberate in hearts and souls, stirring the reader or hearer, whoever he or she may be, to journey toward that deeper dimension. He reminds us that it's actually time to reach across the divides that surround us and break down every wall of inequality and injustice that we can. It's time to build bridges in whatever ways we can conceive and seek peaceful resolutions. It's time to defend the vulnerable and the oppressed. It's time to unite and see our own reflections in the faces of others. It's time to, carve, to find a way to carve out room for quiet and respect for creation, the environment. And it's time to even delve deeper into our own spiritual traditions and pass out all the outward imperfections and trappings and to the core of life. In one final vignette from Khalil, his words inspire and challenge us towards, as he often said, our greater selves. It's titled, Set a Sheet of Snow White Paper. Set a sheet of snow white paper, pure was I created, and pure will I remain forever. I would rather be burnt and turned to white ashes than suffer darkness to touch me or the unclean come near me. And the ink bottle heard the white paper saying that, and it laughed in its dark heart, and, but it never dared to approach her. And the multicolored pencils heard her also, and they too, though, never came near her. And the snow-white sheet of paper did remain pure and chaste forever. Pure and chaste and empty. I close with the moving words of Khalil's good friend, Mikhail Naimi, who wrote the first biography of Khalil just three years after he died. For some purpose unknown to you and to me, Zubran was born in Lebanon at the time he was born. And for a reason hidden from you and me, Arabic was his mother tongue. It would seem that the all-seeing eye perceived our spiritual drought and sent us this rain-bearing cloud to drizzle some relief to our parching souls. Thank you. Um, I came here um, knowing about uh, Khalil's writings, but I didn't know anything about his personal life, so thank you very much for all of the insight that you shared. Uh, my question, or my curiosity, is about his sexual and romantic life. Can you speak to that at all? Yes. It's an interesting first question. Uh, <laughs> yes, Chabron uh, was very close to a number of women. Uh, some he loved in the sense of romantically, others he loved in the sense of soulmates. Uh, he never married. Uh, he did propose to a woman who was about 10 years older uh, at 
one time, Mary Haskell, who I mentioned briefly. And at that time, of course, you can imagine she's very much from the establishment. He's an immigrant, an Arab immigrant, south, uh, south end of Boston. It just wasn't something that she could probably consider. She eventually came around, and by that time, he had already decided it probably wasn't wise and it wasn't for him. Uh, so, uh, some people say, you know, I've read some of the biographies that this was, he was someone who didn't have any physical relationship with anyone. Uh, I would beg to differ quite substantially. Uh, but he never married. Uh, but he had these intense, close relationships with about five or six women. One that uh, continued all of his life, Mary Haskell. Uh, and then another one that wrote the first uh, biography uh, in English of him, uh, not too long after he died, called A Man from Lebanon. A question has come in from online. What do you think Gibran would say to us today in this country about how to get back on the right path? Mm. I think I spoke to a lot of that in many ways. I think he would uh, very much be all about uh, trying to see ourselves in the other uh, and realize that, I mean, he, what he did is his, the, 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 his deep journey, he went uh, into himself and he discovered that we're all the same at the end of the day, regardless of faith tradition, regardless of culture. And if we think our time is divided right now, his time was actually very divided, especially in his part of the world. So he faced similar challenges. And I think he exemplifies someone who found a way to not just bridge, but to embrace. And not just embrace, but to be complimented by in his own life because of the difference of the other. Thank you. Another question from any of you. Thank you for that. That was wonderful. Um, I was wondering if um, you were most aware of Gibran's work before you embarked on your caravan, and was this all sort of symbiotic, or is this what, and also the second question is, um, do you think the travel is something that infuses people with this, and is it a requirement for that breadth of soul searching? Tra the travel? Right. You mean into Gibran's life? And your life also. Oh, my life, yeah. I mean, I first became interested in Gibran when I was in high school in the, on the Ivory Coast, Côte d'Ivoire. And the Lebanese uh, student, a colleague of mine, brought home after the holidays a copy of the Prophet. He was from Shia, Muslim background, and so I naturally thought, that's why I thought, oh, it must be, you know, related to Islam. And he was obsessed with it as a high schooler. So that's where I first heard of it. Then when I was doing, uh, and of course, like many, I had heard of the book, The Prophet, though I hadn't actually read it. And then when I was doing research for another book, the one just prior to this, uh, on, a, on someone who bridges between Christianity and Islam, he's a well-known Syrian novelist named Mazhar Maluhi, and the, he calls himself, he self-identifies as a Sufi Muslim follower of Jesus. And just in that phrase, he's bridged a lot. Uh, it was during that period that I was struck, because everywhere I was going, I was hearing about Khalil Gibran in the terms, especially in the world of Arab literature and spirituality. So I was intrigued, and that's what caused me to look a little more deeply into it. In terms of actually the element of travel or how to, I mean, what I've come to see is I've come to see, the way I like to describe it is, and this church is, a, this cathedral is a great example because you've got all these mosaics here. I like to see it as this divine mosaic with each little chip, each little piece, being a different cultural and religious and spiritual expression. And we are only complete when all of those little chips are visible. And, uh, and that's when we're most whole. So travel sometimes helps in that, uh, but I think it can be anywhere. But I think it's a worldview, it's a mindset. Uh, and actually enhancing our own faith tradition, regardless of what that is, by the experiences of the other. Hello. So many people have relied on Gibran during times of personal adversity, and I know you mentioned he experienced the loss in a short time period of his family members. Were there any other episodes in his life that were particularly dark times from which he draws kind of these words that are so comforting um, to so many? It seems 
other instances in his life suggest a sense of um, insulation to some degree from deprivations of a more material kind, and I would just be interested in your thoughts on the balance between circumstance and his writings, which reach people in circumstances of all types. Right. Uh, yes, he had different, he had this, the early suffering on in the sense of uh, his family passing away and losing his art and all of that. I think he suffered on a number of levels. I think he suffered in the sense of the cross-cultural identity. You know, he really wasn't from here. And he was no longer there. And he longed for that, but he never went back as an adult. I think he, financially he suffered quite substantially. So he had a patron, but it wasn't a wealthy patron in that sense. And he was involved in some financial dealings that collapsed and he lost pretty much everything. I think he was a true artist, which meant he felt deeply. So there's some interesting letters written after he died about during World War II, uh, where his sister and one of and the women that wrote the first biography of him here in the United States are writing and talking about, thank God Halil's not around, he couldn't have been able to handle it in terms of the feeling, the, what he would feel, the pain. And of course, he felt tremendously uh, a lot of pain for his own people during World War I, uh, especially in, during the Ottoman era, toward the latter part there, that Ottoman occupation, where there was a lot of famine and starvation going on uh, in greater Syria at that time. So from a number of angles, I mean, he died largely of cirrhosis of the liver, which means he put down a lot of Iraq. And one of the things I like about Gibran, so he was coping. Interestingly, and I never, I don't believe he would have said, follow me in the way I'm living. He was about pointing a sign, a direction from what he was learning and experiencing. Uh, and one of the things I think um, that, that's why he gravitated to William Blake. Uh, and he, I mean, he loved those phrases of William Blake, joy and woe are woven fine, a clothing for the soul divine. And when this we rightly know, through the world we safely go. Under every joy and pine runs a thread or a silk, a, a joy, a, a thread of silken twine. And I think he discovered that silken twine right in the midst of, paradoxically, in the midst of both of those things. So I'm attracted to Gibran because he's not a saint. He's ident we can identify with him, you know, in that sense. He's not this other you know, out there, but I do think that suffering led to the depth in many ways. Good afternoon. This is not a question, but a big uh, thank you from uh, World Lebanese Cultural Union. I belong to World Lebanese Cultural Union. My name is Alpha Jabarian. I am Armenian Lebanese American. Absolutely. Ed Edward Karim and his wife. Uh, Edward Karim is the president of World Lebanese Cultural Union in California region. So uh, we want to thank you for this beautiful spiritual journey. And as many members and supporters of WLC, you know, uh, the mission of the organization, which has 360 chapters worldwide, is to venerate the legacy of Khalid Gibran. A couple of years ago, the organization in cooperation with the City Hall of the City of Los Angeles has uh, erected the statue of uh, Khalil Gibran on the city grounds in Los Angeles. So uh, I want to thank you for uh, the immense contribution in keeping the legacy of Khalil Gibran going and touching the hearts and minds of so many millions of people around the world. And may your uh, hard work uh, uh, create more results in, in, uh, in favor of humanity. Khalid Gibran, now this, now I, I, have, I have ended the message, the official part of the message. Now this is me, uh, my personal message now. Actually, it's a question. Uh, Khalid Gibran at one time wrote about Lebanon, uh, talking to the corrupt establishment of Lebanon, saying, your Lebanon is yours. My Lebanon is mine. So 
my question to you, had he lived long enough, would, would he have written about the corrupt establishment in, in, uh, in our uh, great United States? Your America is yours, my America is mine. <laughs> I, I think if he certainly lived at this moment in time, I think he would have, for sure. Thank you. My question is, do you see any connection between Gibran and Rumi? Mm, good question. Uh, I, one of the beautiful things that I had the opportunity of doing was all of his books in his library that he had in New York, at that little studio, the Hermitage, are now in Bishari in uh, Lebanon. So I went through them, opened them up, and etc. There are no books on Rumi there, but there are a lot of books on Sufi poets, Hafez, Ibn al-Arabi, uh, Halaj. So he was very influenced by Sufi literature, not Rumi so much at that time. It just probably their worlds. And of course, you know, Rumi was only brought to the West in a sense in this way in which everybody knows about him fairly recently in that sense. So, uh, but there are a lot of similarities, very much so. This is Manit Bourgeois, who is on the advisory council and represents the Zoroastrian faith. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the in incident where uh, Khalil uh, advises someone that you do not have to convert to Buddhism, but look into deeply into your, the core teachings of your own faith. So. Did he realize, uh, you know, in his mind, uh, the problems that are caused by different religious groups, you know, trying to convert people from one good religion to another? And was he trying to suggest, you know, that you don't need to convert, just look into your own head? It's mm -hmm. a good question. He writes never about conversion. Of course, what he does do is he assimilates other parts of other faith traditions into his own to create his own spiritual journey. Um, so he's, that is, that he was not oriented that way at all. It's interesting, though, culturally in the Middle East, you know, if you're born Muslim, you're Muslim. Even if you don't practice. If you're born Christian, you're Christian. And uh, so, hence, you saw he titled that letter a Christian poet to Muslims, okay? He wasn't a practicing traditional Christian, but identification-wise, he was Christian, of course. Um, so, no, but he wasn't about proselytism and that kind of thing. Uh, this came from our uh, uh, live stream. Uh, wonderful question. How has your journey in the search of Hebron's life changed or affected your spirituality? I think, uh, well, we all change by experiences, don't we? And of course, obviously, this has had a role in, I mean, it played a part in my own life. Uh, I've been on a journey. I grew up in Senegal, West Africa, a Christian minority within a Muslim majority context. All my friends as a young man were, were Muslim. And there was no difference. But then as I got older, I remember my teenage years, beginning to observe adults very clearly start making distinctions. And I remember thinking, it shouldn't be this way. There has to be another way. So, so much of my own life journey has been about bridging between the two and finding effective and creative ways to do that and looking for individuals who actually embody that, sages, if you will, in my own life, and Gibran ended up being one of those. So, yes, he had a role, but I was on this track. I've been on this track for a long time. Thank you. Let's have a wonderful round of applause for Paul Gordon.